Let's give it up for Tyler. Thank you. It's very optimistic. I hope I earned it. Um, cool. So I'm Tyler. Uh, I've been a product manager at Google for a little over eight years. I've spent the vast majority of that time on the Chrome uh, team. So if you guys use Chrome, which you should, uh, I, I spent uh, most of that time working on things like the new tab page, search, password managers, or front end features like that. But I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about sort of more abstract principles of how to construct a persuasive argument, which is obviously really critical for product managers, but not necessarily exclusive to. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit uh, about some sort of general overview of psychology and some cognitive biases that we're all prone to. We're going to go through on a kind of lightning tour of prospect theory, which is how people reason about value and risk. And then we're going to talk about some sort of practical tips and tricks, knowing these facts about the human psyche, how you should construct your arguments to make them more persuasive and compelling. And there's enough of us here that we're going to try a little bit of science. So those of you who are interested, at some point I'll be asking you to take out your phones and answer some simple questions, and then we'll conclude with some graphs about how you guys answered. And if I'm lucky, I'll catch you in some cognitive biases and convince you that they're actually real. And if not, you'll see some graphs that make you feel smart. Uh, cool. So all of the psychology that I'm going to be talking about and referencing today is sort of explored in longer form in greater detail and with more justification in the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So if you haven't read it, I strongly encourage it. I think it's a really fantastic book. If at any point I say something where you're like, that doesn't sound true, the book is the citing that I will do for everything. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm mostly just repeating to you things that I have read from this text, but I have certainly found them to be true in practice. The central conceit of thinking fast and slow is that our mental experience is sort of comprised of two separate and distinct systems. System one, which is sort of an intuitive, heuristic-driven system that's extremely cheap, it's involuntary, it's fast, but it's also very imprecise, it's approximate. And then system two, which is more of how we think we think, it's kind of precise, it's logical, it's uh, directed. So we have these two systems in our toolkit, one which is cheap but inaccurate, and the other which is precise but expensive. And they have sort of a bunch of different uh, ways of reasoning about the world. Your system one thinks about the world in largely the way that a child does, in terms of black and white certainty about things, cause and effect stories, and a kind of total knowledge of the answer even when they don't actually have enough information to know that. System two, on the other hand, is more of what it feels like when you are thinking that you are thinking. So when you sit down and solve a math problem, or when you fill out a form, when you memorize somebody's phone number, or when you try and drive in heavy traffic, these are all the things that system two is taking care of, which is why it's how you think you think, because it's the part of your thinking that you're most conscious of. It's the sort of thinking that is effortful and also takes up some of your capacity. So you can't do multiple system two things at the same time, even though you can do a lot of system one things at the same time. There's a lot of differences between these two systems. We don't necessarily have perfect knowledge of how these works. This is relatively new psychology. But one thing that I want to emphasize is that this is not pop psychology. This is not like a metaphor here. When you ask someone to do a mental task that invokes system two, their muscles tense, their blood pressure and their heart rate rise, and their pupils dilate. They start to perspire. It is hard work to think hard. And you can actually observe it in a scientific context. So while we don't necessarily understand the limits of the boundaries perfectly, this is a very real and observable phenomenon, and not just a sort of thought experiment about what people might be like. <clears throat> For our purposes today, there's one aspect of the difference between System 1 and System 2 that is most important, and that's the last one, which is that System 1 is the source of confidence and belief, and System 2 is the source of skepticism and doubt. So... Everyone here tonight either works in or aspires to work in an industry which prizes logic. So I'm confident that you all understand the importance of having sound reasoning to back up your arguments. And that is important because people are very adept at activating their system to scrutinizing your claims and asking you to defend them. And if you can't defend them, then they're not going to be convinced. But it's not sufficient to just address system two, because system two is not how you come to believe things. If you construct an argument that only addresses the concerns of System 2, people will still be suspicious of your arguments, even though they can't find any flaws in them. So in order to build something that's actually compelling, that's actually persuasive, you need to address both of the systems. And since, for the most part, people understand how to build logically reasonable arguments, we'll be focusing today on how System 1 reasons about the world, and some of the ways in which you can cause something to seem more or less appealing to our kind of intuitive selves. <clears throat> 
All right, so for those of you who are interested in playing along, this is where the game starts. You feel free to pull out whatever device you have that has connection and go to odeen.com slash convince yourself. O-D-E-A-N dot com slash convince yourself. So uh, the rules of the game are this. Uh, we'll be having uh, two batches of slides that have some questions. Each slide you'll get about 20 to 30 seconds, so you're going to want to make a decision relatively quickly. Some of these uh, questions are going to be math questions. Obviously, you are all holding computers in your hands, so I'm confident that you could use a calculator. The purpose here is more to measure your intuitions than your ability to deploy tools. So even though it can feel kind of counterintuitive, please just take a guess and don't actually like Google any math or anything like that. Um, Yeah, so uh, uh, you should uh, not use any uh, 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 calculators or the like, not look anything up, and then uh, the, nothing about your answer is going to be tied to your identity in any way, so there's really no point in cheating, no one will be impressed, I won't even know that you did it. <laughs> All right, so hopefully folks have had a chance to load up uh, odin.com slash convince yourself. Let me get started. Cool, so for this first slide, go ahead and just take a look at it, kind of scan through the words. Let it wash over you. It's a pretty good slide. I'm happy with it. Cool. All right, this one's a little more interactive. So uh, four questions here. Uh, for each question, you're going to choose either A or B, depending on which one you think is larger. Now, obviously, this is one of those questions where you can convert things into different formats and make them easier. Please just answer with the formats as written. Uh, so if you think A is larger than B, you should choose A. If you think B is larger than A, you should choose B each of the four numbers. I'm trying to gauge from the craning whether or not people <laughs> had a chance to see it. All right. Get your, get your answers in. We go to the next slide. All right, so the next question is to write in two numbers. The first number you should write in is the last two digits of your cell phone, so the final two numbers in your cell phone. And then the second number you should write in is your guess as to the total number of VPs working at Google today. I don't actually know. Less reading on this one, so hopefully a little easier. Everyone got their answers in? Fantastic. All right, last one for this section. There's a 1 in 10,000 chance that you have a fatal disease. I am selling the cure. How much would you be willing to pay for the cure to a disease that is fatal, but you have only a 1 in 10,000 chance? Cool, so let's dive back into the informational part of things. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cognitive biases that we're all prone to. And the first and kind of most important thing to understand about cognitive biases is that they're like optical illusions. Understanding them doesn't mean you can outsmart them. Even if you know how an optical illusion works, it still looks like the snakes are moving because that's how your eyes work. And your brain works the same way. The things that I'm going to be describing to you are fundamental properties of how you think. They're not things that you're going to like learn the lesson today and be like, aha, now I'll never be prone to that form of bias again. It's actually how your brain operates. So the only thing you can do is understand how those biases will affect you and understand how those biases will affect your audience because they're not optional. Even for someone who understands them deeply, you don't get any advantage about being able to bypass them. There's obviously an effectively infinite list of cognitive biases that we could be talking about. For the purposes of today and trying to construct persuasive arguments, there's five that I'm going to be focusing on. Availability, anchoring, representation, coherence, and framing. So availability is, roughly speaking, how easy is it for you to conceive of an idea? The easier it is for you to picture something, the more it is likely to seem true when you try and imagine it. 
Now this makes a broad amount of sense as a heuristic. The things that you are building out of your own experience are true by de or more plausible by definition than things that you have never encountered before. And moreover, uh, being uh, sort of suspicious of things you've never encountered before makes a lot of sense in a survival scenario. But the problem is that there's a lot of things that can drive this fluency that are not actually correlated with the likelihood or truth of an idea. So if you, uh, an idea which is especially vivid, especially easy to picture, one that you've encountered recently or frequently, one that was displayed or explained to you in a very clear way, which hopefully I'm doing tonight, or something that you encountered when you were in an especially good mood, all contribute to the feeling that something is likely, common, good, and true. So some simple examples of this. It turns out that people are more likely to believe a fact if it's presented in bold font. Bold font is convincing. It's convincing because it's legible. And because it's legible, it's easy to retrieve, which makes it feel true. Similarly, witty sayings, aphorisms, that uh, people uh, sort of pass down as folk sayings, are more convincing when they rhyme. And the reason that rhyming makes them more convincing is because it's easier to remember them, easier to retrieve, easier to believe. Anything you can do to sort of strip your argument down to its simplest, smallest components will make it easier for the part of your brain that becomes convinced of things to remember and process it, even though it's operating with a relatively limited attention span and relatively limited memory. So you want to try and make things as sort of simple and uh, compact as possible. And then good mood. I assume many of you have heard this statistic, but I love it, so I'm going to say it anyway in case some of you haven't. Uh, you're more likely to be granted parole by a judge who's just eaten lunch. Uh, so if you're scheduling meetings with VCs or executives, go for the early afternoon. They're going to be in a good mood. It's going to make them more receptive to all of the arguments you're going to be making. This basic pattern is why advertising works. Things that you have seen a lot and that you have seen in a sort of very clear and legible way ultimately come to seem like true things. It's also why we overestimate certain categories of risk. So if you've seen a plane crash in a news recently, then you'll have a very vivid recent memory of what that looks like, and it will make you scared of your own flight, even though you understand logically that there's no connection between those two events. The fact that it's so vivid makes it feel more compelling. This also cuts in reverse. And this is kind of where not invented here syndrome comes from. The systems, the processes, the ideas, the people, the teams that you're familiar with, that you know intimately and that you can picture easily, are going to seem more trustworthy and more normal than things you have more difficulty picturing. And it's important to remember that that heuristic is very reasonable. Your brain is a survival machine, and in the majority of situations where there's a negative outcome throughout your evolutionary history, the negative outcome was game over. So it's very conservative. And it's totally reasonable to say, you know, you're all by definition alive today, which means you can be tautologically confident that nothing you've encountered so far has killed you. Things you've never seen before don't have that proven history of safety. And so they are naturally more suspicious. And what that means for you is that you should know when you are first introducing an idea or an argument or a concept to a person, it's the moment they're going to be least disposed to it. That's the moment when it's the least familiar, which means it's the moment they're going to like it the least and be the most suspicious of it. So if you want to convince someone of something, make sure that you've told them it's coming. Because if they encounter it for the first time, it's going to feel threatening like an ambush. So I'm sure that uh, you have all heard the term anchoring before. Anchoring is our tendency to use convenient reference points when we're estimating a value. And the reason this happens is because the sort of system one is not very good at math. And rather than trying to do math, it sort of just cribs from nearby examples. Now, when you're looking at a series of things and then trying to compare how that thing looks to previous things you've seen, this is a perfectly reasonable strategy, very effort efficient. But the problem is that system one always has an answer, even when it shouldn't, which means that it's going to be anchoring on things whether or not those anchors are actually helpful reference points in making comparisons. So when you're looking at the original sale price on a, a tag, that anchor is being used to manipulate you by giving you a reference point for what you should do when you're estimating the value of the product, which is sort of the unknown that you're estimating. Anchoring is a much bigger deal than most people think it is. Experimentally, it's measured at around 40 to 55% of people's guesses. More if they're tired 
or stressed or distracted or hungry or any of the things that diminish our capacity. So anchoring has significant ability to affect your estimation of things. My favorite example of that is that people struggle to estimate the odds of things going right because they anchor on the odds of one thing going right and, and don't adjust sufficiently for uh, uh, the chain of dependencies. What's happening is system one is choosing the anchor and being like, I don't know, anchor. And then system two is coming in and saying like, well, all right, we should adjust the anchor in accordance with whatever set of information we have available to us. But that adjustment is effortful. And that means that we're more likely to err in the direction of the anchor than we are to err in the other direction, which is how anchoring is having the effect that it's having. Another significant time that anchoring comes up is with readily available comparisons. So uh, this is actually the result of an experiment by an economist named Dan Ariely. Uh, on the right, you can see, this is about how to sell subscriptions to The Economist. On the right, you can see three options. The web for $59, print for $125, and the web and print also for $125. Now, all of you are fine and sensible people, and so I'm sure you immediately notice that the middle option is terrible. There's really no reason to prefer the middle option when the third option is strictly the same thing plus more for the same price. So that kind of begs the question of why The Economist bothered to put that false choice in. And the reason becomes clear when you look at the left side so these two pie graphs here show the percentage of people who choose various options when given either two choices or three. This is not an error. Nobody chooses the second option on the right. They only choose either web or web and print. But the presence of the option print sets an anchor point for how much you should value the print experience in isolation, which causes you to value the package web and print at a larger margin than you would without that anchor point sort of driving up the value. And you can see the dark green here is people who subscribe to the most expensive option, web and print. The fact that print was a bad option caused a huge swing in people's preference towards the option that it was obviously worse than. When you have an obvious comparison in a set of options that you present people, make sure that obvious comparison is flattering the choice you want them to make because whatever obvious comparisons there are are going to be hugely beneficial to whatever the sort of beneficiary of that particular uh, comparison is. Uh, Dan Ariely's favorite example of this is if you're going out to a bar to meet people, you should bring someone who looks like you, but a little worse. Uh, uh, so representation is our tendency to reason about things by building a sort of representative sample of what that set of things are in our mind. So the exact experiment that was done to prove this was not done with iPhones. It was actually done with plates that are worth around $30 to $40, but I couldn't find a good photo of the same plate, both broken and not broken. So I went with the iPhone. Don't read too literally into it. But what this is saying is when you show people both of these sets at the same time, three new iPhones and four new iPhones and a broken iPhone, they're smart enough to realize that the second set is a superset of the first and therefore worth more. But when you show people them in isolation and ask them to estimate the value, or at least when you ask them to do that with things that don't have quite as obvious a sticker price as an iPhone, what happens is they don't do the math. They instead build a representative sample of what the quality of that set is. And the presence of the broken dishes or the broken iPhone damages that representative sample. And so people view it as less valuable than set A. So what this means for you when you're constructing an argument is don't keep piling arguments on until you run out because the weaker arguments that you're putting at the end are diminishing people's memory of the stronger arguments you made at the beginning. They're not going to remember the sum of your arguments. They're going to remember a random sample. And so you want to make sure that you keep it to the highlight reel. That'll make your argument feel more compelling, even though arguably uh, more arguments should be strictly better. Coherence is our desire for the world to be essentially itself. We would like for things to make sense. So we would like for selfish people to be selfish, brave people to be brave, smart people to be smart. We would like for bad ideas to be bad in all of their aspects. And we would like for everything to have a reason because it makes the world easier to think about. So our opinion about an idea tends to be hard to compartmentalize. If you find an idea risky, you're probably going to think it's expensive and vice versa because our sort of valence of an idea affects our opinion of every facet. We also don't 
reason well about probability. We have no natural intuition for probability. We either believe a thing or we don't believe a thing, or at least that's how system one does. System two is capable of reasoning about probability. And so rather than actually talking about things in a statistical sense, we instead reason about things by building a story of why those things happened and then seeing how consistent that story is and whether or not it makes sense. Which means that we really struggle to believe the role of chance and luck and coincidence even though intellectually we understand that those are large forces in the universe and that sometimes things just happen. But when we're trying to explain things in practice, we want a causal narrative. We, we strongly desire an explanation that has a cause and effect storyline to it. Coherence is also the source of halo effect. I'm not a big fan of halo effect as a term because I think it sort of is like only one facet of the broader coherence bias, which is much more complex and interesting. But halo effect is really important. Halo effect is when your opinions about an idea or a person tend to inform your opinions about every facet of that idea or person. So you dislike someone, you flip the bit on them, and then you can believe nothing good about them, even things that are unrelated. Or conversely, you like an idea, and so therefore you're unwilling to accept that that idea has any drawbacks because it's easier to reason about a world in which good things are good and bad things are bad. Now this happens, you know, in a sort of overt way. You occasionally have a friend who, like, has just decided they hate something, and you're like, okay, I understand that you're no longer willing to talk about this, and it's not worth arguing with you. Uh, flipping the bit is how I always talk about that. But it actually happens in smaller ways all the time to you right now. And you can kind of observe this in yourself by watching how uncomfortable this sentence is. Hitler loved puppies. So that's a weird sentence. It's weird to say, it's weird to contemplate. And the reason it's weird is because your expectations for history's greatest monster don't leave any room for him to show any measure of kindness, even in an area of life unrelated to the historical reasons that you have a negative valence towards him. So we don't really think of Hitler as being nice to puppies, even though historically that's not really a part of why we think of Hitler as being a bad guy. Coherence is also where we get confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is that desire to ratify your beliefs rather than correct them. And the reason that we have this desire is because we prefer to inhabit a world in which we can tell the consistent story that we have always been a smart and capable person making smart and capable decisions. Admitting that you were wrong requires accepting that you, the protagonist of your own story, at some time in the past did something dumb or wrong or something that you regret. And that is actually literally physically difficult to contemplate. So a lot of the people that sort of suffer the most from confirmation bias, they're not necessarily arrogant so much as they're having difficulty reconciling this notion of containing multitudes, of a smart person being capable of thinking a dumb thing, which is just hard for us to reason about. So the last bias uh, that I'll talk about, and then we'll start diving into prospect theory, is framing. So framing is the tendency for the context in which we encounter a decision or a piece of information to deeply color how we interpret it. So. In 2006, France and Italy played in the World Cup. France lost and Italy won at the same time. Those statements are logically interchangeable because soccer is a zero-sum game. So to a perfect logical computer, these two images would be telling you the same thing. But since you're a human, you don't think logically. You think in an associative way. And system one is involuntary, which means that when you look at the left image and then look at the right image, you're actually going to experience that information in a different way, and you can't choose not to experience it differently. On the left, you'll be thinking about France, you'll be thinking about defeat, and on the right, you'll be thinking about victory and excitement and Italy. And that's just the nature of how System 1 encounters things, and System 1 can't be turned off. Probably the most important part of how framing affects how we see things is that framing tends to determine what we see as default or normal. Um, I, I'm sure many of you have heard this stat before, whether or not you've seen this graph uh, this is showing the consent rate for organ donation by country, with uh, countries in blue, the forms are opt-out, and countries in orange, the forms are opt-in. So what you can see from this is that even for a decision that's as emotionally freighted and significant as whether to donate your organs after your death, the vast majority of people are content to let the form tell them what normal is and then do the normal thing. And the reason that we prefer that is because we consistently assign more risk and regret to acting than to failing to act. And deviating from normal is an action. 
all else equal, you would rather not take that risk. So unless you have a preference, you're going to go with default, which means that when you're setting up an argument, you really want to control how you're framing what the default option is, because that's a very powerful tiebreaker. All right. So those are the cognitive biases that I want to talk about today. We'll be referencing them again when we talk about the specific practical tips for how to structure your arguments. Um, but I wanted to take you on a whirlwind tour of prospect theory. Prospect theory is how Daniel Kahneman uh, won his Nobel Prize. He's a psychologist who won a uh, Nobel in economics. So it was a pretty cool idea. And what it is, is it's a description of how people reason about outcomes under risk. Decisions of uncertainty, basically. And he sort of resolved some uh, seeming inconsistencies in how people reason about the world. So it's a little tricky, but it's really powerful in predicting how people are going to think about things. So it's worth trying to barrel through. So the first thing to understand is that people do not reason about the world in absolutes. So you reason about all outcomes as either a gain or a loss from a particular reference point. You don't think about it in the absolute. And an easy way to think about that is if all of us in the room tonight took all of the cash in our pockets and pooled them together into a pile and then gave everyone equal shares of that pile, we would by definition all have the same amount of money but half of us would be stoked, and the other half would be like, why did I go to that talk? So you, you can't know how you will feel about an outcome without knowing about the reference point that a person is going to be comparing it to. And it's important to remember, too, that most times the reference point is the status quo, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If you're really counting on a promotion, if you're certain you're going to get it, then you might experience not getting that promotion as a loss, even though technically it's a foregone game. So it just depends on what the reference point that you're starting with is when you're considering an outcome, and that's uh, not necessarily always the status quo. The other thing to remember is that we're about two to two and a half times as loss-averse as we are gain-seeking. So we will go almost twice as far, no, we will go more than twice as far out of our way to avoid a loss than we would to go seek a possible gain. So when you're presenting outcomes to people, it's important to remember that losses and gains are very much not symmetrical. My favorite example of this is that professional golfers are 3.6, I think it's 3.6, it's 3 point something, 3.6-ish percent more likely to make a putt for par than they, to make a, they are to make a putt for birdie. Now that makes no sense because par and birdie are calculated per hole and the payoffs for professional golfers are pay, calculated per tournament which means a putt is a putt is a putt is a putt. They all matter equally. But when you have a mental accounting per hole, you experience putting for par as avoiding a loss, and you experience putting for birdie as seeking a gain. And so even for people who should be as rational about their golf game as professional golfers, there's still a noticeable better in performance when they're trying to avoid a loss within the context of a single hole. Most product management decisions, and actually, to be honest with you, most business decisions, are decisions of risk management, which is too bad because humans are terrible at risk management and terrible at risk estimation. In particular, we are bad at uh, estimating events with low probability. Um, we have a sort of minimum quanta of risk that we're capable of reasoning about emotionally that we have any intuition for. And so we either round rare risks down to zero and discard them, or we round them up to that minimum quantity, which is generally larger than a lot of rare events actually are. We tend to overestimate risks when they are emotionally saturated or when they are presented concretely in a narrative form or when they're easy to picture. So this is very much availability bias rearing its head again. When you hear people give you the advice to construct your uh, presentations or your documents or your, your pitches uh, around user stories, the reason that people are suggesting that you do that is because it's more concrete, which makes people estimate it as larger, even though when you add more detail, you're statistically making that event less likely, right? So the additional detail makes it easier to picture, which makes it easier to reason about in an emotional sense. So when you're looking to have people view a particular rare event as especially likely, you should try and make it very vivid and very picture-oriented. And when you're talking about trying to make it seem less likely, you should make it more abstract and more statistical, which people have less trouble reasoning about. So it's much scarier to look at a photograph of a child that says one in a thousand children are affected than it is to look at a pie graph that says 0.1% of children are affected. 
we don't know what a 0.1% is, but we know what a child is. So we can picture a child and that makes that presentation much more vivid, which makes us estimate that risk is higher. Independently from our ability to estimate risk, we also don't necessarily value it in a perfectly logical way. So the graph that you're looking at here is uh, from real experimental data. It looks smooth, but it's actually, this is, this is what people's lab reported results look like. And this is, the blue line depicts how much people would be willing to pay for a bet which pays out for $100 with the probability listed on the x-axis. And what you see there is two things. At the lower end of the spectrum, you see that people like gambling. They're willing to buy lottery tickets. They like dreaming about the possibility of a positive outcome. So they're willing to pay a little bit more than the expected value of a bet for a small payout or a small odds large payout. On the opposite end of the spectrum, people really dislike a near certain thing. They would much rather have a certain thing which was slightly less good. And that's kind of why people are willing to buy insurance is to sort of avoid the risk that their positive outcome could be uh, inter interfered with in some way. So when you combine these two things, our loss aversion and our sort of weighting of uh, the desirability of risk, you arrive at a pattern which Kahneman calls the fourfold pattern. And this is a little bit confusing, but stick with me because it's incredibly useful for predicting people's opinions. Basically, the uh, x-axis here, on the left, you have losses, and on the right, you have gains. And on the y-axis, you have near certainty at the top and possibility at the bottom. So let me walk you through each of those quadrants. So in the upper left-hand corner, when you have a near certain loss, when it's almost certainly going to be terrible, that makes people risk-seeking. They're hopeful. They're willing to roll the dice because it's all going to be crappy anyway. So this is the impulse that makes people reject plea deals and go to trial, even though they're probably going to get convicted, because they sort of are believing that all the outcomes are so bad that they might as well accept the risk. On the lower left-hand side, the possibility of large losses make us fearful, make us uh, a low-risk outcome of a highly negative situation makes us want to buy insurance. And so it's sort of it's the opposite uh, risk posture. In the upper right hand, uh, this is kind of the mirror image of that, a near certain gain is also a possibility of a negative outcome. So if you have a lawsuit against a company that you believe on the merits is very good and you're likely to win, the reason you might be willing to accept a settlement is because of the regret you would feel if you had gone to court and lost and you could have had the settlement. That feeling of regret makes you fearful, makes you willing to compromise is the reason that we're willing to accept settlements. And then in the lower right-hand corner, this is probably the most intuitive quadrant. This is the possibility of large gains, which makes us hopeful, makes us risk-seeking, is the reason people are willing to buy lottery tickets. So if you want to encourage compromise, then you want to present things as near certain gains or as possible losses. And if you want people to be idealistic and stick to their guns, you want to present things as near certain losses or as low possibility gains because those things kind of encourage people to have a compromising or uncompromising posture with respect to risk. All right, so pull out your devices again. This will be the second and last uh, batch of questions. We'll give folks a moment to unlock their screens. All right, so first off, you can just study this slide, let it wash over you and just scan the words. This is probably the most important slide that we'll be going over today. <laughs> Fabulous, all right. So the project has 100 dependencies. Each of those 100 dependencies has a 95% chance to go according to plan. What are the odds that the project will go according to plan and that all of the dependencies will go correctly. This is obviously another one where the tool in your hand could solve this very easily, but please just use your estimation. Cool. All right. So I would like you to rank each of these words from most negative at negative two to most positive at two. And in particular, I would like you to imagine that these words are flavors. So think of it as going from the least palatable to the most delicious flavor. I'll give you guys a little while on this one, it's a little longer.
I've actually only done this talk once, and it worked the first time, so I'm hoping it'll work this time, too. All right, cool. A pharmaceutical company is interested in running a test where you would have a 1 in 10,000 chance of becoming infected with a fatal disease. How much would the pharmaceutical company need to pay you in order to be willing to participate in the test? All right, so you've all completed the test, and in a little while we'll tell your results and see how it turns out. Um, cool, so uh, this will be the practical part of the talk and probably the most useful to you. I wanna talk through a couple of basic, five simple tips and tricks for constructing arguments in a compelling way is sort of rules of thumb to keep in mind for any arguments you're making regardless of the format or form factor that you're delivering them in. And then we'll talk a little bit about specifically uh, trying to be persuasive in the context of somebody disagreeing with you, so adversarial persuasion. The first advice that I have for you, and the simplest, is that you should keep it simple. Remember that the easier your idea is to comprehend, the more System 1 will be able to handle it without invoking System 2, which means that the less naturally suspicious a posture that people will be in when they're contemplating your ideas. You want to make sure that you only include your highlight reel of strongest arguments because people, because of representativeness, are going to remember the average convincingness of your argument and not the total convincingness of your argument. So your weak arguments are going to deteriorate the memory of your stronger arguments. Make sure you just cut them out entirely. It'll make your argument easier to remember and easier to believe. And then relatedly, and this is kind of a subtle one, you want to make sure you're only arguing one thing at a time. It can be easy to get distracted by all the many things you might want your audience to believe and sort of muddle your message. You want to make sure that at any given moment you have a laser focus on the one sentence that you're trying to get people to agree to or believe. Now, this is especially important when you're talking about slides. I, people, I see people make this slide mistake all the time. You often hear people say, like, don't make your slides busy. The reason that that's important is because the slide is way more important than what you're saying. All of you are trying to listen, or I hope you're trying to listen to what I'm saying, but the system one is involuntarily chanting, keep it simple to yourself every time you look at the screen, which means that you're way more likely to remember that message than you are to remember the things that I'm saying out loud. And so it's really important that this stay focused and on message because otherwise it is going to randomize your audience. They, are, they have no choice but to experience it. You wanna think of the slide as being like the chorus to the song. It should be the thing that you're kind of like dancing around that's an anchor point that people can keep returning to and understanding your message. And you wanna make sure that if all they do is read the, the biggest words on your slide, that they get the basic point. Uh, the second thing that I would say to you is you never want to surprise anyone. I see people make this mistake because of two reasons. One is that they're kind of simulating entertainment, and so they want the surprise because it's more dramatic and more kind of like uh, compelling in that sort of entertaining sense. But it's important to remember that the same things that make something thrilling are the same things that make it dangerous and suspicious. Like we enjoy roller coasters, but we don't feel safe on them. And so you don't really want to be drawing that much from the field of entertainment. You don't want to be boring, but you should probably be closer to boring than to interesting because for the most part, boring and obvious are cousins. And in particular, you don't want to uh, surprise anyone because of availability bias. Remember that the first time that people encounter your idea, it's going to be the least familiar and therefore they're going to like it the least. So you want to introduce new ideas, especially controversial new ideas, the way that you would introduce cats. Don't just shove them in a room and hope for the best. Instead, you want to like put them in nearby rooms and then like exchange things that smell like each other and then like let them see each other but not interact and then like let them interact in a supervised way and sort of like slowly ramp it up. So what this means in a business context is, you know, if you have a controversial thing that you would like to convince people to believe, start by telling them that you plan eventually to try and convince them of it. Say like, hey, I'm going to make this argument in a month. Not now. Don't worry about it. But just so you know, I'm going to be making this argument in a while. And this works at a macro level, you know, telling people like, hey, next quarter, we should really think about X and then making the case for it when the time comes to plan next quarter. It also works at the micro level. So at the beginning of this talk, when I said that the five things we were going to go through, you were now more likely to be receptive to the ideas because I told you they were coming. So that's why signposting is really helpful because it makes all these ideas feel more immediate, gives them more fluency, 
which makes them feel more compelling. So as much as possible, you want to try and be like constantly advertising your ideas before you sell them. Think of every time you mention an idea to someone as basically functioning like a display advertisement for it and use those display advertisements to your advantage. Always try and make it as easy as possible to agree with you. So the starting point there is to control what the default outcome is and make sure that the default outcome is something that you're happy with. So you want to make sure that you leave the ball in the court of anyone who might disagree with you and not in the court of someone who wants to agree with you. So don't say, hey, do you think we should ship the widgets? Say, hey, assuming that there's no feedback or objections, we're going to ship the widgets. And then that way you've pushed the sort of burden of action. And remember, acting is very difficult. Going with the flow is very easy. You push the burden of action to disagreeing with you instead of asking someone to come out of the woodwork and grant you permission. So always make sure that you set the default and make sure that it's something that you like. And then the other thing to remember is that you don't want to leave behind open questions in things that you want people to find appealing. Now, this is a really subtle one. I see people make this mistake a lot. Sometimes you want to leave behind open questions because you feel like it gives you option value. And then that way, the audience can choose for themselves and they'll pick the favorite, right? Like, I don't care what color the widget is, so I'll just tell them we can ship either red or green widgets because I really just want them to be excited about shipping the widgets. But the problem is, reasoning about the outcome red or green widgets is more effortful than reasoning about the outcome red widgets. So except for situations where you're really making the wrong choice, most of the time people are going to find that evaluating the outcome A or B is harder and therefore feels less compelling. And so you don't want to leave behind, like this is basically leaving behind exercises for the reader in the, in the questions that you want people to be attracted to. So make choices. Be receptive to the possibility that they might push back on those choices and ready to sort of swap in. You know, if they don't like red widgets and they raise their hand, you can be like, oh, fine, green is totally cool. But don't just leave it to them to decide because the effort of thinking through which one they want will make them less satisfied with the outcome overall. Make a choice. Open questions in things that you don't want people to be attracted to are totally fine. So sometimes that can be really nice if the people who are making the counter argument are sort of falling for this fallacy. You can be like, sure, we'll put in all the open questions you want. They can have any choice they like. You want to make sure that your options, the things you're rooting for and trying to persuade people of, are very easy to picture. So the more details and specificity that you can give them, the more compelling they'll be. So we talked a lot about how people evaluate outcomes in terms of gains or losses from a reference point. This is hugely powerful in terms of how it affects people's preferences. But the interesting thing is that the majority of people are not actively curating their own reference point. So it's relatively easy to set the reference point for a conversation and people will just adopt them. So you want to make sure that you're sort of careful when you describe things as gains or losses, that the reference point is one that sort of puts your audience in the right quadrant of the fourfold pattern to be receptive to either compromising or uh, being uncompromising, depending on what you're trying to convince them of. So make sure that you are thinking proactively about what the reference point is and that you are making sure that your reference point is communicated in the argument. You don't have to specifically say this is the reference point, but you want to make sure that you're describing things as either gains or losses from a specific thing. Or if you don't have the opportunity to set it, if somebody already has a strong reference point, at the very least, you want to make sure that you're aware of it and that you understand it so that you understand whether you have an uphill or a downhill battle of convincing them of things. Yeah. So, uh, so the uh, last tip for sort of general argument construction that I would offer you is make sure that you control the presentation. And this is kind of seemingly obvious, but it's hard to be intuitive about how important this actually works out. So we all kind of know intuitively that like uh, a memorized speech or a polished presentation or a flashy suit aren't really part of a good argument, but sort of, you know, compel some people. But the thing that you want to remember is that it actually compels all people, maybe to greater or lesser extents, but there is no one who is immune from that sort of stylistic bias. So when you're thinking about your presentations, your arguments, your documents, your emails, whatever format you're making your arguments in, make sure you seriously consider legibility. It has to look easy to read because that is literally going to feel easier and things that feel easier are going to feel more convincing. So style matters. Making something small and grayed out text will cause people to sort of think harder when they're reading it, which will make them less likely to believe that you're trying to... Con to believe the thing you're trying to convince them of. Whoa.
So uh, you also want to make sure that you uh, dial up or down how uh, compelling a risk or a probability is in your audience by making it easy to picture or hard to picture. The more concrete it is, the more real and more likely it's going to seem. And then you want to make sure that you eliminate any unflattering comparisons and prominently feature any flattering comparisons. So the ugly wing friend principle that we talked about when we talked about The Economist. Um, sometimes you cannot remove an unflattering comparison. It's like too obvious an option. People are going to bring it up if you don't bring it up. If that's the case, then you should try as much as possible to physically separate them or to separate them temporally. It turns out that just putting these things on different slides, putting them at the beginning or end of a document, beginning or end of a meeting, the more stuff you could put in between those things, the harder that comparison will be, which means it'll have a less dramatic effect when it's influencing people's sort of intuitions about a space. So think about the comparisons that your audience is going to be drawing and make sure that you plan for them to benefit the, the options that you're hoping to invest in. Okay, cool. So the most fun kind of persuasion is adversarial persuasion. So up to this point, we've sort of talked about all of our persuasive acts as presenting people with a menu of options and hoping that they choose C. In this case, we want to talk about it if the person already disagrees with you or if you and the person who disagrees with you are mutually trying to convince a third party, a decider like an executive or a VC or whatever the case may be. So the first thing to remember is that you want to argue as little as possible. You want to define the argument as narrowly as you can, and you want to work to keep narrowing that argument down further and further throughout the context of the conversation. The reason that this matters is because it costs you capital, political capital, to disagree with someone. And the reason for that is the halo effect. When you disagree with someone, you give them evidence that you're the kind of person who disagrees with them. And given how certain they are that they're smart and capable, the fact that you're the kind of person who disagrees with them is a strike against you. So every time that you argue with them, you're giving them a little mini display advertisement for not caring about your opinion anymore. So you want to do that as little as possible. Conversely, you want to find ways to agree. If they say something that's sort of irrelevant but true, pounce all over that and agree with it. Because then you're telling them that you're the sort of person who agrees with them. And that's the kind of smart, trustworthy person that they're going to listen to when they present an argument. So you want to make sure that you're not treating arguments as a game where getting the other person to concede that you were right gives you points. Like a lot of people have this sort of gladiatorial metaphor in mind when they think about persuasion, where they're like, I'll pin them down and force them to admit they were wrong, and then everyone will agree I was best at meeting. And that's dumb for a whole list of reasons. I mean, for starters, nobody really wants to work with a person like that. But it's also not really convincing. You can't actually bully someone into believing you. Persuasion is a cooperative act. You can only bully someone into getting out of your way. So if you're really actually trying to convince them, you want to make sure that you're sort of cultivating the relationship of trust and the commonality between you and the person that you're disagreeing with and sort of making sure that the disagreement is as narrow a slice of your overall interaction and interface as possible. You also want to argue forwards, not backwards. And what I mean by that is a lot of times people get hung up in re-arguing past arguments. If you think we should ship the widgets, it is not important whether we should have shipped the widgets a month ago. And if you get distracted arguing about whether or not we should have shipped the widgets a month ago, you're wasting capital that you could be spending convincing people to ship the widgets today. And moreover, it's really hard to admit you were wrong. It is literally difficult to conceive of a world where you made the wrong choice. Which means that if you're trying to convince someone to ship the widgets by convincing them that they were wrong about shipping the widgets last month, you're choosing the hardest possible route to convincing them to ship the widgets. That is like a very uphill battle. You're much better off trying to convince them that new information has come to light that now makes shipping the widgets make sense. So rather than convincing them that in the past they made a mistake, focus on convincing them that going forward they should agree with you. And don't worry about the past so much. You also want to make sure that you're prepared as much as possible to argue both sides. You want to be ready to loan your rhetoric out freely. And what I mean by that is you want to traffic more in arguments than opinions. You should be clear and transparent with everyone about which arguments you personally find the most convincing, but you should be equally ready to relay and explain arguments that you don't happen to believe, but that other people in your organization or world do. And 
You should be just as willing to use all of your rhetorical skill and all of your sort of argumentation strength in presenting the arguments that you aren't personally convinced by as the ones that you are. The reason that this is valuable is threefold. First of all, it will communicate to people that you disagree with that you understand their point of view and respect it. And so even though you're disagreeing, it sort of invests in the working relationship. And if you end up winning the argument and they end up zigging instead of zagging, then the people who were voting for zag won't resent you because they'll understand that they had a seat at the table, that they were listened to, and that you took their ideas seriously because you were just as willing and able to defend their ideas as you were to do your own. The next thing that it will convince people of is that you must be confident in your arguments. Because if you weren't confident in your arguments, you wouldn't be willing to give all those advantages to people that you disagree with. So you're sort of forcibly demonstrating your certainty by being willing to help the other side of an argument. And the last thing is that if you can argue an opposing view as well or better than the people who hold it, then it's going to make it look like your understanding of their argument is superior to their own, which is going to make it look like your belief in the argument that you find convincing is justified because you're not missing something about the other side. You actually understand it deeply, so deeply that you're able to make the same argument that they would make you just are also able to make a better one. So be willing to loan your rhetoric out. Don't think of yourself as being on a side. Think of yourself as just being an advocate for clear argumentation and persuasion in the abstract. So the last thing to remember about adversarial uh, persuasion is that any given decision that you are likely to make is almost certainly small in comparison to the sort of to totality of decisions that you're going to make with a team. So don't always be playing a zero-sum game. You know, leave some meat on the bone. Be prepared to be persuaded. Sometimes be willing to compromise. It's important when people are listening to your arguments that they believe that you're listening to their arguments as well. Remember, they're only going to believe somebody who thinks like them and who is trustworthy to them. So in order to cultivate that belief in your audience, in your team, in your stakeholders, you need to be cultivating the same belief from you need to cultivate your belief in their trustworthiness, in their intelligence and capability, and in the importance of deeply understanding their views and sometimes compromising. So uh, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Most people know the prisoner's dilemma where you uh, sort of have two people and they can either cooperate for a good outcome or betray each other. And if they both betray, it's bad for both of them. But if one of them betrays, it works out great. It turns out that the prisoner's dilemma is only a dilemma if you're doing it a finite number of times. If you're doing it an unknown or infinite number of times, the optimal strategy is actually to cooperate because the value of future cooperation will outweigh the value of trying to sort of maximize your wins in a specific thing. So if you feel as though an argument is going your way and you're about to convince the deciders to do all the things that you want, take a look at whether or not there's any dimensions that you might be willing to compromise on that the opposing side might care more about than you and be willing potentially not to win every argument. Because then over time, it will say to people that the reason you hold a view is because that view was the best view and not because it was the one that you attached yourself to first and now you're dogmatically pursuing it at all costs. All right, so I'm gonna attempt to do some science here. We'll see how well this works out. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to uh, the graphs in my slide and refreshing them with all of the data from the questions that y'all just answered. So hopefully we will have some things to look at and we can talk about how cognitive biases are affecting you. But unfortunately, it is not working for some reason. How disappointing. All right, well, uh, we'll send out the deck. And by the time we send out the deck, we'll actually have the graphs. So hopefully, you'll be able to see the responses that you gave. Fortunately, it's not working right now. So I'll just dive directly into the uh, Q&A. Cool. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a little hard for me to tell you what the current research is. I can tell you that in general, it's hard to understand those systems even in a snapshot today. So understanding how they've changed over time is probably pretty difficult, but I'm not totally sure. Wouldn't, wouldn't want to bluff and claim psychological expertise when I don't actually have it. <laughs> Yeah, the first and last are most important. The first is important because they're going to anchor off of it. So if you give them a, a bad first impression, then they're going to sort of estimate the value of your argument on the basis of that first impression. So you want to lead with a really strong argument. And then the last one is going to be the one that's the easiest for them to remember. So it's going to have the most, uh, the strongest effect on their representative memory of your arguments. So in that kind of classic sandwich principle way, you want your strongest argument first and your second strongest argument last. No, all else equal, your best argument is like really short and succinct and just like wins with three words and then everyone goes home. Um, how did you learn all this stuff and do you have any more resources for us to learn more about this kind of problem? Yeah, totally. So I should be repeating the questions. So how did I learn about this and do I have any resources that I would recommend? Yeah. Uh, I would say that the, the most obvious and significant resource is the book Thinking Fast and Slow. It is a lot of the content that I went through in like one slide is like a chapter. So you get like a much richer, much more thorough understanding of it. It's an amazing book. It's, it's a little dense, but it's totally worth it. Um, in terms of uh, persuasion, another view on persuasion that I think is really interesting and valuable, but is sort of orthogonal to what I presented today is uh, Robert Cialdini's, uh, uh, yeah, the something of influence factors of influence, maybe. So he has six principles that he outlines in terms of how to construct persuasive arguments that are a little bit more marketing focused as opposed to psychologically focused, but they are totally apt and I think they're really worthwhile. And then beyond that, I would say eight years of trying to convince room full of engineers that they had all independently come to the same conclusion coincidentally gives you a lot of <laughs> practical experience in what works and what doesn't in constructing compelling arguments. Sure, yeah. Bad, um, because I, I guess I sort of struggle with the idea that there, I feel like there should be like some sort of like, like a rational answer, like some truth. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get to that point, but in order to get to that point, you have to manipulate it. Oftentimes, we manipulate people to like get to that point, but if you're manipulating people, then it's actually, this is actually the, the true answer to the. Like, yeah. The so, two questions. At what point do you wake up one day and realize you know all the secrets of product management? I can tell you it is more than eight years out, <laughs> so I'll let you know when I hit it. Um, in general, the confidence curve, I think, is sort of this like rising and falling. Uh, so every once in a while, you learn enough to notice how much you didn't know before, and you're like, oh, God. <laughs> that, that sort of is like a momentary drop in confidence, but it's there's no like day you wake up. And then the second question was like, this all kind of sounds maybe a little manipulative. How should we feel about it ethically? And what I would say to you is this, uh, cognitive biases are real. You know, we can, we can describe them as illegitimate or not, but they are definitely going to affect how people uh, interpret your messages. So you can either plan for it and make sure that you structure yourself in such a way as to be advantaged by those things, or you cannot and be disadvantaged by those things, but there's no option to evade it. Like there is no option where we say like, let's all just be logical here for a moment and you know, do the pure rational thing. It's like, ah, it's, that's just not how our brains work. So the way that I would think about it is you want to have motives of clarity and explanation. You know, like you don't want to be trying to trick people into things when you're persuading, because even if it works in the short term, it'll backfire in the long term. It's much more important to have a trusting relationship. So planning for these things in the context of trying to make sure that you helpfully explain to your audience what you're thinking, most people won't feel that's uh, manipulative. Like for example, I used a lot of the things that I described in the course of this presentation, but I'm assuming that you probably don't feel manipulated even though I tried to make the slides simple, right? Because it's like that's just makes it more approachable, easier, gives you more control. 
for the most part, when you're wielding these tools correctly, it will make people feel confident, and so they will like it. Um, but you definitely, it doesn't absolve you of the kind of ethical questions of convincing people of a thing. Like uh, the other thing that I would mention is, you know, these kind of rhetorical tricks are a bit like makeup, like. Uh, used judiciously, it can flatter our best features and minimize our drawbacks. Used uh, sort of injudiciously, it can make us look clownish. And no amount of makeup will make a pig beautiful. So it's the, they're, they're small parlor tricks on the fringes. And the reason they matter is because a lot of these decisions are very difficult, which means a small edge can be the difference between choosing zig or zag. If zig or zag had an obvious advantage, it wouldn't be the kind of thing you wanted to convince people of. You always want to convince people of things where you could go either way. So that small edge really matters, but it doesn't necessarily absolve you of having to have a good argument. You know, it's just a, a little bit of grease on the wheels, if you will. I think one assumption here is that people you're working with want to Does any of this change if you're dealing with people who are just very stubborn, who are waging a war of attrition, torture, of being I'm right or wrong? Have yeah. you ever had to deal with that? Yeah, so how, how does any of this advice change when somebody's sort of gone scorched earth and, and fully flipped a bit and is arguing with everything? Um, I would say a couple of things. Uh, these techniques have an effect on everyone, regardless of their posture, regardless of their feelings about you. So it's, it's always non-zero. It is also not a magic trick. So it's not going to take someone who's at war with you and convince them to be your bestie. Um, it, for people who have that particular posture of like, I hate everything, they are often demonstrating availability bias. Like the people who have that posture are often saying like, I've already found a little domain and it's my domain and it must be the best because I chose it. And so the things that you can do to increase availability of things that you would like them to be more receptive to really help. So toy example, if somebody thinks that a team is terrible and stupid and always making the worst decisions, you should have that person go sit with that team for a while. Because once they become real human beings that they can picture and understand, the familiarity bias will cause them to feel more receptive to that team's ideas and decisions. So this is kind of why you know, a lot of corporations do offsites or, or encourage people to go visit each other's offices is because that availability bias will cause you to be more cooperative with the teams that you've interacted with in person. Um, but again, it's not a magic trick. So it, like there are still going to be people that you won't necessarily convince of things sometimes. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I think Thanks for coming. I, I have only 15 minutes. It was the best 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so if you disagree with someone, how can you do it in a way that builds trust? I would say that the thing that really builds trust is people's belief that they have been listened to and understood. So it's not really necessarily agreement. So if you sit down and let someone tell you how they feel and then repeat it back to them until you found a way of expressing it that they think is apt and accurate, then you can say to them like, okay, I understand that, but I still don't believe it because X, and they will feel like you fully respected and engaged with them, even though you didn't end up at the same conclusion. The thing that people feel disrespected by is feeling as though they were sort of isolated from the decision-making process, and they had been sort of cut out in some sense or silenced. So you can build a ton of trust without ever agreeing with someone. And in fact, some of the engineers that I've worked the best with over the years have been engineers that thought I was kind of an idiot, but I was an idiot that they could work with. They're like, ah, you're fine. You always change your mind when I explain it to you. So it's like, you, you don't necessarily need to agree with people, but what you need to do is you need to resolutely believe that their perspective is important, even when you disagree with it, and you need to do things to demonstrate that belief in a convincing way. So if you spend a lot of time with them, if you listen carefully enough that you can repeat their arguments back, if you defend their arguments when they're not in the room to do it for you, or to do it for themselves rather, all of those things are going to build trust without necessarily having anything to do with agreeing with them. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, these, these patterns are always advantageous, but, you know, they're still uphill and downhill arguments, right? Sometimes it's harder to convince people of a thing for a whole host of reasons, but the, the tools and, and techniques are still useful. The places where they're the most useful 
are the contexts in which uh, people are stressed or distracted. So if you have an hour long round table meeting where you're confident everyone will have done the reading beforehand and there's gonna be a leisurely discussion, this stuff probably doesn't matter as much. If it's a 20 minute review that needs to go through five topics and everybody there didn't get lunch, then it's probably gonna matter a lot because in that context, people have relatively little capacity to spare. And so the intuitions that they use to sort of use heuristics to save on mental capacity are gonna be in more display, more significant. So it's not necessarily so much you know, are certain people more receptive to certain things? There's obviously some amount of truth to that. But the thing that I think is more relevant is in certain contexts, it's going to be more important and more valuable. Say that again? Yeah, should you always headline your topic? I'm a big believer in that. I, I think generally speaking, transparency and uh, clarity and not ambushing people are all things that make people feel safe and in control. And when they feel safe and in control, they're more likely to believe things. So, you know, announcing that you plan to make an argument in a week, and then at the beginning of that meeting, announcing that you plan to make that argument and it's going to come in three parts. And then at the beginning of each part, announcing that it's the first part and then announcing that it's the second part and then announcing that it's the third part. All of these things will make people feel like they're navigating your mental space with confidence and that will make them feel more receptive to the ideas that they're exploring in that process. So if a group is completely new to the idea that you're talking about, then that's kind of an unfortunate circumstance for you in terms of persuasion. It's going to be really hard to introduce someone to an idea and convince them to like it at the same time. That's, that's sort of to be avoided if you can. But regardless of the scale, that advertising is always better than not that advertising, right? So it's still better to have signposting at the beginning of your talk that says, this is what I'm going to be saying, even if you didn't have a chance to preview it with people privately beforehand. Do we have time for one more question? So like overcoming confirmation bias in yourself? Like overcoming people's distrust in you in a space because you screwed up in that space at some point in the past? Interesting question. Okay, so the question is, if you at one point made a choice or advocated for a choice that turned out badly, how can you then go back and convince the same audience that you should be trusted this time, even though last time it went awry? Is that a fair description? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. It's uh, People are less outcome oriented than you would think. Uh, one thing that will happen with an outcome is that people have hindsight bias. So they tend to overestimate their past predictions of things that happened. So if you ask people to predict a series of things and then you go back and ask them to remember their predictions, they will remember having made better predictions than they actually did. And so you, when you made a mistake in the past, people are going to remember themselves as having always known it was a mistake, even though they might not have, right? That sort of, a, that creates that feeling that you, uh, you were, in the past you was so smart that you saw this coming. So you do have to overcome a little bit of like, they're going to feel like they, they knew it and you, you were the sort of, poison pill that ruined it. Uh, you want to try as much as possible to present that decision as having been arrived at by the group. Ideally, when you're doing persuasive work, because you're persuading, it's a decision that the group arrives at. You might have been a person who was advocating for it, but you didn't force anybody into it. You know, you weren't the boss that said, like, we're going to zig no matter what you think. You were, like, sitting in the room and saying, like, I really think zig. What do you think? Do you think zig? So later, when you talk about that mistake, assuming that you've sort of done this persuasive way, you should be able to fairly and legitimately say, we made that mistake. And now we know better things to do in the future and not necessarily feel like because you were the first one to advocate for an idea that the group eventually arrived at that you bear special culpability. Although realistically you do. <laughs> so.